Okay, you're all uh, and welcome and thank you for coming to the Edward Wester Mark Memorial Lecture. In 1983, the Finnish Anthropological Society, together with the Westermark Society of Finnish Sociologists, launched a lecture series to uh, honoring the work and memory of Edward Westermark, who is known as the pioneer of Finnish anthropology and sociology. The memorial lectures are held annually, alternating between the two learned societies. And some of the most acclaimed anthropologists, including Joel Robbins, Tim Ingle, Marshall Salins, Marilyn Stradern, Roy Wagner, Jean Komarov, Maurice Bloch, Mary Douglas, have all given the lecture in which they have touched upon a wide range uh, of current and debated issues in the discipline. So it's, it is thus our great honor to introduce Professor Philippe Descola, who will present the 18th Anthropological Edward Westermark Memorial Lecture. And Professor Descola has a long and distinguished career in anthropology and is currently the chair in anthropology of nature at the Collège de France. In addition, he is the director of the Laboratory of, Laboratory of Social Anthropology and the director of studies at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. And Professor Descola began his career as an anthropologist of Amazonia. He conducted three years of fieldwork with the Achuar Chivaros in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And this long period of field research resulted in the book In the Society of Nature, A Native Ecology of, in Amazonia, which examines the Achuar uh, social relations with each other and their non-human environment. Based on rich ethnographic as well as ecological data, the study became an influential work in environmental anthropology. Continuing his study of Amazonia, his equally well-known work, The Spears of Twilight, Life and Death in the Amazon Jungle, is a reflexive account of his long field work with the Achuar. And in his more recent work, Professor Descola has continued to pay particular attention to the environment and people's different ways of forming relations with it. In a volume co-edited with Gisli Balsam, called Nature and Society, Professor Descola, as well as other authors, problematized the long-standing division of nature and culture. Going beyond Amazonian ethnography, <coughs> Professor Descola explored the different modes of identifying with, relating to, and categorizing non-human nature. And this laid the groundwork for going beyond simple dichotomies of relativism and universalism, as well as nature and culture. <coughs> and Professor Descola continued this project in his latest book, Beyond Nature and Culture, a bold comparative work in different ontologies in the best French structuralist tradition. And published in 2005 in French and translated only in 2013 in English, the book has already gained substantial attention and generated lively and fruitful discussion. And today, Professor Descola will be talking about the new approach to the anthropological study of landscapes based on the process through which landscapes are constituted by deliberately changing the appearance of sites so that they become iconic sites that can stand for something else. As this is based on Professor, Professor Vespola's current studies, we are very privileged to hear his Edward Westermark Memorial Lecture titled Landscape as Transfiguration. Please. My warmest thanks go to the uh, uh, Finnish Anthropological Society and to the uh, uh, Westermark Society for inviting me to be this, this um, uh, Westermark Memorial Lecture. I'm both uh, free and honored by this uh, uh, occasion. It is uh, customary uh, when asked to deliver a name lecture to say uh, a few words of praise for the person whose um, memory the lecture series uh, pays homage to it, present case, Professor Edward uh, Westermark. However, although I read bits and pieces uh, of the history of human marriage when I began to study anthropology, and this was of course linked to my closeness to the discourse and to his interest in the kinship studies, um, and I also read um, uh, uh, the very informative book that uh, David uh, Shankland published uh, not long ago on Westermark. I'm ashamed to confess 
that uh, none of the main topics of interest that these uh, most illustrious anthropological ancestor uh, system of marriage, the origin of uh, the human family, the theory of morality, um, figures prominently on my research agenda. However, I do favor the uh, comparative approach that Westermark uh, advocated all his life, that is the testing of anthropological hypothesis by checking uh, their explanatory value and scope against empirical evidence. An endeavor which tends to fade away nowadays in favor of what one may call ethnographism. Uh, that is sometimes unwarranted, small-scale uh, inductive generalizations out of very narrow case studies. In this lecture, I will in fact attempt uh, to combine both anthropology as a hypothetical deductive method and ethnography as an interpretive one uh, to test a new approach to and definition of the concept of landscape and to look at its purchase on an ethnographic case to wit the Amazonian Ochoa uh, of the uh, Ecuadorian rainforest with whom I spent some of the most interesting uh, years of my life. And by doing so, I hope to honor uh, another great Finnish anthropologist Raphael Kasten, uh, himself a student and a ruling disciple of Westermark, um, a noteworthy Americanist and a remarkable pioneer in uh, the ethnology of the Hiraran tribes, I myself studied some 60 years later. So, back to the anthropological question then. What is a landscape? And more precisely, how are we to define a landscape if we wish to extend the concept beyond the few cultures who have created representations of sites, whether in images or in writing? Do we only find a perception of a landscape in the civilizations where a tradition of depicting, depicting it uh, has flourished, or may we use that concept in an anthropologically productive way by detaching it from its aesthetic background? To these classical questions, they have been classical for a number of years, there are two main lines of answer, none of which, for me, is really satisfying. The first kind of answer uh, could be called extensionist because it extends the field of meaning of the original concept to the point where it has little bearing anymore with its specialized definition such as it was, as it was construed in Europe uh, from the Renaissance onwards as a pictorial or literary representation of a piece of land. And the extension may operate in different manners. The most common in the social sciences um, consider landscape as what results from human labor on the environment, an objective phenomenon then, which can be studied everywhere by following the way opened up by human geography, uh, ever since Alexander von Humboldt set to this discipline, which he largely created, uh, the mission of studying uh, what he called the progressive habitability of the earth. This meaning of landscape, which is widely had been, has been widely adopted by uh, historians, archaeologists, and anthropologists, in my view, retains nothing of interest from the initial uh, 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 denotation of the word and imposes, moreover, a dualist conception of the environment, that is a physical substratum, uh, socialized by human action, which hardly corresponds to the manner in which most 
non-modern civilizations conceptualize the places where they dwell. Another, which I, which I, I, I think even more trivial, uh, form of universalization of uh, the notion of landscape is the one uh, which takes the term in its loosest meaning as the space cognitively and emotionally uh, apprehended by a human subject. And since every human develops a subjective apprehension of space forged by a combination of personal tastes, biographical, biographical uh, particulars, and uh, cultural upbringing, it results that there are as many experiences of landscape as there are individuals, so that one cannot say much about landscape in general. These manners of uh, breaking with the conventional meaning of landscape are not, in my view, very productive, either because they do not respect the originality of the notion of landscape as it developed uh, along two lines, one, one in the Germanic languages, you know, the Landschaft, landscape, uh, uh, and the other in the Roman languages, paisaggio, paysage, paisage, etc. Uh, they do not respect the originality of this whole line of descent uh, as it developed initially in Europe, or on the contrary, because they do not respect the peculiarities of the non-European societies to which they are applied. By contrast, the other uh, approach to landscape could be called comprehensive in that it, so to speak, densifies the uh, comprehension of the concept instead of extending it. It revolves around the idea of the landscape as a representation of a piece of land seen by the viewer which was put forth by historians of art such as uh, Kenneth Clark and uh, Ernst Gombrich, who both emphasized uh, the exceptionality of, the pictorial, of this pictorial genre. The uh, comprehensive approach is peculiarly developed in France among some geographers and philosophers, and it requires that a set of strict criteria be uh, satisfied before one, one can uh, qualify anything as a landscape or a landscaping scheme. Notably the existence of a word or words uh, that can be translated as landscape, of literary creations celebrating the beauties of nature, of pictures that have the representation of a piece of land as an exclusive theme, and of pleasure gardens, which manifest the desire to emulate aesthetically uh, a pleasurable environment. And I do agree that we need explicit <coughs> clues in this matter, since no one has access otherwise to the sensible world of others. How am I to know that my actual neighbor, and this is a common experience I've had several times, with whom I, I am watching uh, the sandbars emerging uh, from an Amazonian river against the backdrop of a stormy sky, uh, does perceive in what he sees the kind of landscape that filters my own vision uh, in form as it is by a long familiarity with landscape painting of different traditions, especially of the Dutch 17th century. However, this approach, by fixing a priori criteria, uh, and it is uh, a reasonable attitude, has the disadvantage of closing the inquiry before it uh, even began. So one will certainly be in a position uh, to recognize the predefined criteria, but one will, uh, will one be able to uh, detect what we may call a landscaping intention or pattern in the laying out and the use of a site if these criteria are not present. This is why 
I chose to embrace a third approach. It is predicated on the idea that if one wants to exploit the most interesting feature of what the notion of landscape referred to initially, one has to associate this notion less to constituted objects, pictures, gardens, laid out environments, than to the very process by which these objects are constituted into landscapes, a process which may be defined as a transfiguration. When applied to a site, a transfiguration is a deliberate change of appearance, at the end of which this site becomes the global sign of something other than what it was globally before it was transfigured, revealing and actualizing in the process some features that it contained potentially. So a landscape is, in my view, above all, an object intentionally produced or fashioned by humans so that among a diversity of other possible uses, utilitarian, recreational, religious, etc., it may function also, also as an iconic sign standing for something else, to it a portion of a real or imaginary space. Acknowledging this difference between the materials of the composition, <coughs> vegetation, buildings, water, reliefs, etc., and the outcome that it produces, whether a garden or a picture, for instance, does not imply at all either that this transfiguration leads to an aestheticization, that is, uh, the quest for a result that pleases the senses, or that it presupposes a marked divide between the physical substratum existing beyond all representation, or would that be possible anyway, and a cultural poiesis that would give it a sort of a posteriori meaning. To produce a landscape, this transfiguration should satisfy three conditions. First, the result of the operation must be deliberately sought after, not be the fortuitous result of an action conducted for another end. Second, this operation must not be exclusively utilitarian, that is, aiming at the laying out or the technical improvement um, of a productive, a defensive, or a dwelling site. And finally, at the end of the operation, there must exist a clear conscience uh, that, on the part of those, of course, who have undertaken the operation, of a difference in nature uh, between the elements they had at their disposal initially and their metamorphosis uh, in what we will conventionally, conventionally define as a landscape. Transfiguration, taken in that sense, can present itself under two modalities. One is direct, and is the transfiguration in situ. That is, the laying out of a portion of environment, most commonly under the form of a garden, this is at least as it was studied most commonly by people interested in landscapes. And the other modality is indirect, and it's the transfiguration in visu, and it expresses itself in figurative codes, uh, conditioning the representation of landscape in pictures, of course, but also in scale models, for instance, and structuring, therefore, the perceptual uh, schemes conditioning the manner 
in which a piece of land would be seen. To uh, uh, recall the uh, uh, formula by uh, the historian uh, Thomas uh, on his book on, on nature, uh, 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 the landscape is pictures because it looks like a picture. So there is a landscaping scheme that filters the vision. How are we then to detect uh, traces of this process of transfiguration where neither landscape painting nor pleasure gardens are to be found? To do that, it is necessary uh, to expand the scope both of the transfiguration in visu so as to include in it other forms of iconic representations of the world than those that can be uh, recognized in conventional landscape painting and of expand and expanding also of the transfiguration in situ so as to include in it other forms of creation of ecosystems which do not follow the standards of the art of pleasure gardens, let's say, uh, whether they be European or Far Eastern. I will only deal in this lecture um, with the latter aspect. And a lead seems particularly promising for renewing the scope of the transfiguration in situ. It's the meanings attached to subsistence gardens. One can be readily admitted uh, that pleasure gardens constitute a legitimate expression of an in situ transfiguration, which leads, leads up to uh, more or less extensive forms of landscaping. There's a tendency uh, to consider subsistence gardens as having no other function than utilitarian or perhaps with a little bit of symbolism uh, added as a sort of coating on the cake. Um, it is far from being the case, of course, and uh, this is what I would like to show with some examples of Amazonian gardens. Like many tropical gardens of polyculture everywhere, Amazonian gardens uh, combine two characteristic features which provide a fertile ground for processes of transfiguration. On the one hand, they are swiggers, that is, they render patently visible the relationship between cultivated vegetation and the forest cover which it replaces. A relationship which plays on the variations of scale between the two domains and on complex modulations of the articulation between what is spontaneous and what is controlled. On the other hand, Amazonian gardens usually allow for the coexistence in the same plot of a great number of species and varieties in such a way that each plant re requires an individualized treatment. So let us look first at the latter feature. In the case of the, the polyculture of cultivators, propagated by vegetative uh, multiplication, gardening labor in a way appears as an enterprise of pairing and associating singularized vegetable individuals, the assemblage of which must form a harmonious collective. So contrary to the hairy image of the cultivator of cereals, Tropical gardeners are composers, composers who marry plants uh, of which they favor the cohabitation. And this personalized relation derives notably from the fact that the majority of cultivated plants in tropical Sweden are roots that are reproduced vegetatively. That is, clones which uh, are perpetuated thanks to the, uh, a continuous relationship uh, 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 with a human who actualizes this relationship uh, periodically. Let us go 
go back now first to the first uh, feature of the tropical gardens, which is the fact that they, they appear at first glance as the substitution of a spontaneous vegetal cover by a vegetal cover controlled by humans. In fact, the relation between the forest and the garden is far more complex than what appears to uh, a non-informed observer as the conquest of the natural space by an agrarian civilization that we tend to see, uh, uh, inspired in part by the story of the Roman colonization of Europe. Such an opposition between the white and the domesticated uh, makes no sense in a tropical Sweden horticulture for two complementary reasons. First, because the equatorial rainforest has been profoundly affected by human action uh, in the course of millennia, so that it is partly anthropogenic, and with the result that horticulture and silviculture complete each other as much in the techniques they use as in the results obtained. Second, because the garden reproduces at a smaller scale the multi-layered structure of the forest, a stratification which diminishes uh, the destructive effects of solar radiation and bleaching on generally poor soils. Thus, the distinction between the poly polycultural Sweden and the forest, in which it was cleared, is far from clear cut. And on the one hand, because the forest can be seen as a macro garden, on the other hand, because the garden can be seen as a micro forest. For lack of time, I cannot enter here to the technical discussion of these two propositions which have triggered uh, in the past decades a number of controversies. I will restrict myself to the uh, two following statements. First, concerning the notion that the forest can be seen as a macro garden. All the studies in the ethnoecology carried out in Amazonia in the past 30 years, including mine, uh, have brought to light different <coughs> types, often combined, of intentional manipulation uh, uh, by the Amerindians of sylvan species, of fruit trees and palms in the gardens themselves, in the fallows, and in the former sites uh, of habitats and in a peripheral uh, area around the settlement sites. This configuration, which is common to all Amazonia, uh, native Amazonia, and which was aptly christened Sweden Fallow Agroforestry by uh, William Denevan and Christine Paddock, is now widely accepted by the scientific community, and it constitutes a more likely uh, alternative to define the anthropization of uh, the Amazonian rainforest than the claim that there exists completely anthropogenic forests which would have been planted and managed intentionally by uh, Americans. As to the proposition that the tropical garden uh, of Polytasia imitates uh, the forest from a tribal point of view, systemic, structural, and functional, an idea which was put forth initially by Clifford Kurtz in his book on, on, on Java, on the agricultural evolution in Java, and which was also hotly discussed, uh, two remarks can be made. First, that it is unlikely uh, that the populations whose gardens obviously reproduce certain features of the rainforest have attempted to copy deliberately a generalized ecosystem of which they would fully understand the mechanisms and the benefits so as to transpose them uh, a, 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 as a package, so to speak, um, uh, to their own optical, uh, optical system. 
In fact, Gertz himself never claimed that the tropical uh, Sweden gardeners had, had the intention uh, to reproduce in their gardens uh, the main ecosystemic characteristics on which he drew uh, 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 attention, that is the high degree of um, uh, specific diversity, uh, the stratified structure of the vegetation, and the internal recycling of nutrients. All that one can say in his wake is that there exists a structural continuum between the forest and the garden, since both function uh, according to similar ecological principles. And this continuum is due to the fact that in the course of the several millennia during which uh, tropical horticulturists have domesticated the main carthagens, they have little by little perfected techniques of plant management which did not differ in their principles from those that they used in the manipulation of silver resources, notably the selective maintenance of certain plants of which they favored the growth under forest cover. So Sweden horticulture and agroforestry are the, the two sides of the same process of plant manipulation. This is why, rather than asking oneself if tropical gardens imitate the forest or not, it seems more interesting to consider the relations of analogy explicitly detected and stated by Amerindians between these two ecosystems. For lack of time, I will only take a few examples, starting with that of the Achua. Among the Achua, there is little doubt that the forest is perceived and treated as a large garden and that the gardens are planted in such a way uh, as to look like miniature forests in their disposition, in their composition, and in their structure. Let us consider the first point. If the forest takes in the eyes of the Achua the, the appearance of a large plantation, it is not because they cultivate it themselves as a garden, but because they are fully aware that their properly horticultural tissues, and notably the transplantation of approximately 40 species of sylvan plants in their gardens, have a long-term effect on the phytosociology of the forest in the areas that have been regularly cleared for gardens. They actually practice a pioneer type of uh, horticulture, that is, they do not uh, open new Sweden's in recent, in recent fallows, but rather in very ancient secondary forests, which may have been cleared three or four generations ago, and which they precisely identify uh, as such by the abundance in them of useful sylvan species. The high density of useful sylvan species is an indication that the place had been cleared before. In view of the very low human density and of the very scattered habitat, the influence of this long-term anthropization of the forest remains limited, of course, although sufficient to be perceived by a population who is attentive to the distinctive features of the forest that it exploits, as much for food, approximately uh, 50 species uh, of uh, silver plants are regularly consumed, as well as for the variety, a variety of other uses, of course. And also where the memory of the abandoned sites of habitat uh, is retained during a few decades. So within a radius of approximately 10 kilometers from a household, um, the forest can be likened to a vast orchard uh, where women, women and children uh, go uh, very often visit for gathering ex uh, uh, excursions for collecting palm grubs, for poison fishing in the brooks and the small lakes, 
It is a domain which is intimately uh, known, where each palm and fruit tree producing uh, uh, the edible fruit is periodically visited during the, the season. But in as much as the anthropization of this forest, although visible, is not the product of a planned action, the Ashwa only recognizes it as it were in the second degree. Indeed, for them, the forest has been planted intentionally, but by a spirit. So this spirit answers to the name of Shakai, and his main task is to guide men in the labor of clearing gardens. Shakai is conceived as a, the husband or the brother of Nungwe, the female spirit who watches over gardens. So why Nungwe rules uh, cultivated plants, Shakai uh, is the gardener of the seven plants. And as the curator of the forest vegetation, Shakam visits men during their dreams and signals to them uh, the best sites to open uh, new gardens since he is in the best position to know where the land is fertile and where is the plants he cares for uh, uh, thrive best. So due to the fact that it is planted and maintained by a spirit, the forest is no more a white domain in the eyes of the Ashwa than the garden is. This is why it is not difficult for them to consider the vegetal continuum from one pole or from the other, from the garden or from the forest, and to see also in their garden miniature forests, that is, plantations that are similar to that of the spirit Shakaim, but of which they have the care and the responsibility. And the resemblance is obvious, um, as much from the point of view of the diversity and of the intermingling of species, they use over 60 different cottages in a garden on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on a normal measure, no? distributed in 130 varieties. As from the point of view of the stratified uh, of the stratified structure of the vegetation. And the analogies between the two ecosystems are clearly visible, uh, especially because species of sylvan origin are transplanted, as I said, in the gardens, while plants formerly acclimatized in the gardens also subsist in the forest in very ancient fabulous that are almost indistinguishable uh, from climax uh, vegetation. So it would be absurd to uh, take the contrast between the garden and the forest as an opposition between the white and the domesticated. When the Achua clear and plant a Sweden, they replace the plantation of a spirit imitating a garden by human plantations imitating the forest. In fact, both the obvious pleasure that the Ashwa derive from multiplying the number uh, of cultigens and cultivars in their gardens, uh, and the desire to maintain in them the greatest um, possible quantity of sylvan species is less the product of a utilitarian uh, imperative than the symptom of a pronounced attraction for vegetal diversity which can be likened to a kind of aesthetic satisfaction in the collection of plants, which is a common enough disposition among uh, gardeners in other parts of the world. In sum, the vegetal diversity of Ajwa garden, uh, gardens, which is probably one of the highest in the uh, Amazon basin, is not strictly functional, and one may consider it or one may consider that it falls rather in, uh, within the ambit of a desire to emulate at another scale uh, the floristic diversity of the forest. The Ashwa see cultivated plants 
as persons endowed with uh, an interiority to whom admonitions and exhortations can be addressed and with whom one can communicate in dreams and by the medium of spells. These vegetal persons live in families. They cooperate, they enter into conflicts also, uh, so that the garden in a way constitute a micro-society in the literal sense, a collective of leafy people with whom humans just live on good terms. So the plants of the gardens, as I said, are under the jurisdiction of a female spirit, Nungui, who created them initially. And it is only with the agreement that humans can deal uh, with the cultivated plants and are always on a temporary basis. And origin myth relates, and this is not using the myth of social charter, because this myth is known in all Givarian country from the age of two or three uh, uh, upwards. Uh, this origin myth relates that after she had first created the cultivated plants, the spirit Nungui uh, became displeased with the behavior of humans and made the plants vanish. The modalities of the disappearance of plants uh, diverge according to the variants of this myth uh, among the, the, the various uh, Jivaravan uh, tribes. Um, uh, in Shwar and Aguaruna variants, cultivated plants are transformed into silver plants. And there is an Aguaruna uh, variant collected by Brent Berlin, which is absolutely remarkable because um, it, it lists precisely uh, the seven counterparts of the 22 cottages mentioned. And they are usually of the same uh, family and you know, the same genus in some cases. In ultra variants of the myth, the cultivated plants do not disappear, but their size diminishes by successive stages. So, whether their destiny is to disappear completely, to transform into seven plants, or to become diminutive, the plants cultivated by the um, various Jivaran groups are always under the threat of the curse of Nungwe. And the mode of reappearance of the plants after the um, initial catastrophe is not very explicit. In Achuar glosses, for instance, uh, there's an elusive reference uh, to the compassion of Nungwe, who uh, resolves to give back to humans uh, a few seeds and cuttings so that they may plant uh, gardens again. But this act of kindness is coupled, of course, with uh, corollary requirements of uh, humans will now have to work hard to maintain this vegetal inheritance uh, transmitted from generation to generation. So the, this fading of cultivated plants described in a myth um, is an event which, according to the Ashwa, can happen again today. And the experience of abundant gardens uh, 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 gives it an empirical foundation uh, which reinforces uh, the teachings of the myth. For the main cultigens disappear uh, rapidly in the fallows, uh, overcome by the sec secondary uh, vegetation and by the transplanted silver species, that is by the forest regaining again its, uh, uh, its dominion on the, on the garden. And it's a phenomenon which is well known to the Achwa, uh, who return regularly to uh, recent fellows to collect fruits. So the progressive disappearance of the plants cultivated by humans and their replacement by the plants cultivated by Shaktan are for them a common experience which happen to uh, confirm the possibility of this inaugural catastrophe related in the Nungwe myth. So what are the consequences 
of this mythical genesis from the point of view of the garden as a landscape. There is no doubt, for me at least, that the Ashura garden has been viewed as a landscape since it figures in miniature a forest which is similar to the one which surrounds it and is thus, in that sense, a transfiguration in situ, not so much, of course, of a piece of land as of a type of ecosystem. But it is a landscape of a particular kind, um, since the components of this miniature forest, that is, the plants, the use of which were uh, normally granted to the humans, are under the constant threat of becoming sylvan again, as in the Aguaruna variant of the myth I was mentioning a moment ago, changing thus into the sylvan goblets. So the landscape is thus permanently under the threat of disappearing, that is, of reverting to the referent of which it is the iconic sign. It is always on the verge of losing, with its function of sign, its character as a landscape, by merging with what it is meant to figure. So far from expressing an opposition between nature and culture, <coughs> the contrast between the garden and the forest takes the guise of a relation threatened by confusion between a representation and what it represents, a relation of transfiguration in situ indeed, but always reversible. In that sense, one can speak of a metamorphic landscape, which fits very well with the nature of representation in an animist ontology as that of the Achua, for of course, the, 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 the characteristic of an animist ontology is that it allows metamorphosis. That is, the switch between the switch between the point of view of the internal subjectivity of beings and the point of view of their corporeal forms. So the garden, as a space cultivated by humans, thanks to the plants of the Nungui spirit, is an image of the forest, a space cultivated by the spirit Shakheim, who sees in turn the gardens of humans as a forest encroaching, encroaching on his plantations. So metamorphosis is here a, a game of perspective. The garden which becomes a forest again in the eyes of the Achua when it turns to fallow. Uh, uh, is, in the eyes of the spirits, a forest which reverts to being a garden. But there is more. In principle, the garden is a space of consanguinity, and for a number of reasons. First, uh, because it is at the core the domestic space of each household, in which, due to certain properties of the Dravidian kitchen system uh, uh, common in Amazonia, uh, the relations of affinity are erased uh, in favor of relations of consanguinity, so that the house and the garden are seen as ideally consanguine spaces, even if they are not, of course. Second, because the garden uh, is a female space, and the manipulation of the kinship terminology and of the system of behavior uh, results in an association, in an association uh, of women with consanguine sociality. And last, because the plants cultivated by women are seen as their children. And the Achua consider motherhood as a consanguine, consanguine relation uh, par excellence. However, the most common and ubiquitous child plant in the garden, manioc, is also the most 
dangerous since it reputedly sucks the blood of humans, especially of infants, through its sleeves. So manioc thus expresses a predatory disposition, which is characteristic not of the sphere of consanguinity proper to women, but rather of the relations of ideal affinity that the men maintain in the forest uh, by, um, with other men uh, during war and with uh, game animals on the occasion of hunting. Besides, by sucking the blood of human children, the manioc plants merely take revenge for the treatment uh, that their human mothers impose on them since women feed their human children with manioc gore. So this reciprocal devouring of human and vegetable children renders the consanguinity of the garden truly paradoxical. No, it is this paradox which is expressed in the garden as landscape. That is the fact that the miniature image of the forest that it offers is under the permanent threat of disappearing and thus of merging with what it is supposed to figure. For as a sign, the garden is indeed a material object created and maintained by women, that is, pertaining to domestic consanguinity. But it is also via the ubiquitous cannibal manioc, uh, contamin contaminated by the values of predatory affinity, which reign in the forest that the garden figures. The garden is thus both fully an iconic representation of the space, the forest, and at least under certain aspects, a real actualization of this space. Let us now turn more briefly uh, to the meanings attached to gardens in tribal groups of the Amazonian Northwest, uh, more particularly among the uh, Yukuna, the Makuna, and the Mirani. As among the Achua uh, cultivated plants were created there by mythical uh, heroes and they disappeared the first time uh, before being accessible again and uh, existing under the form of persons also, uh, defined as consanguines of women, uh, of the women who take care of them. Among the Yukuna and the Makuna, the mythical genesis of cultivated plants provides the model for their disposition in the garden, which moreover reproduces the special, the special layout of the maloka, the collective house. The latter is organized according to a series of contrasts between male and female, between affines and consanguines, between elder and younger, between uh, ceremonial and domestic space. And the garden is structured exactly according to the same categories, a male, uh, a male front part, a female back part, a rich life center, a profane periphery, etc. Moreover, myths uh, associate coca to a bone, a male element, uh, so that one can see the garden as a human or animal body. In the center, uh, the coca plants form the skeleton, uh, surrounded by the manioc bushes, which symbolize the flesh and the blood. And so in their actual composition, um, Yukuna and Makuna gardens thus reflect at the same time uh, the mythical operations which constitute, constituted them and the organization of social relations uh, in the Madoka, which are uh, also used to understand the social relations between the plants in the garden. The Mirania also plant coca uh, in the center of the plot in parallel rows, the plants being uh, assimilated to the backbone of the garden. Furthermore, the Mirania say that each cultivated plant is guarded by one or two masters who watch over it, most of them being 
let's call them punishing spirits. Generally, they are biting or stinging insects uh, who castigate humans uh, by sending them diseases if they behave badly in the gardens. And in as much as the Miranya garden is a vast metamorphosis of the body of the cultural hero, the demiurge, one understands that the latter wishes to retaliate if the plants which he generated are being manhandled by entrusting this mission to the master spirits of each species. So there's a parallelism, of course, uh, between the garden seen by humans as the body of the creator hero and the human body seen by the creator hero as a sort of garden uh, in which he can let loose his ravaging uh, uh, pests. Lastly, among the Miranya, as among the Yukuna and the Makuna, it is uh, imperative to negotiate with the spirits of the forest the permission to clear a garden. And it, this is a task uh, entrusted to the shaman of the local group. And for all the elements of the world, all uh, sites, all beings have a master with whom one has to become with when one undertakes any activity. So clearing the garden is to encroach uh, on the domain of the spirits who control the seventh flora, and it's a very risky enterprise. Um, and it can only be undertaken uh, with their consent. Among the Miranya, the parallel with the Achua is even more uh, striking. As uh, Dimitri uh, Karadimas, who wrote on the Miranya, uh, writes, I quote, the forest is in fact but a plantation under the responsibility of the spirit master, end of quote. So de facto, the deep forest is a dangerous space under the jurisdiction of predatory spirits who protect the animals and the trees from which they derive their food and who hunt humans. And it can be seen as the garden of animals, and some cultivated uh, uh, plants are indeed considered as humanized variants of seven plants proceeding uh, from the gardens of animals. In some, when the Miranya clear a Sweden in the forest, they destroy part of the garden of animals, and it is to placate their, uh, to placate them, that uh, they offer coca to their masters. So it's obvious that for these four Amazonian societies, and I can go on quite longer in Amazonia, uh, the garden is always a transfiguration, whether of the forest, of the body of the demiurge, or of a microcosmic house conceived as an organism. In all these cases, the relation between the garden and the forest, which are the two basic ecosystems, you have to imagine that they, these are societies, there were societies, but in some cases there still are, where we scattered habitat, you know, so you have a house, a garden, and a forest, and another house, a garden, and a forest, etc. Um, uh, in all these cases, the relation between the garden and the forest, or between the cultivated plants and the sylvan plants, is not expressed in the form of an opposition between nature and culture, or between the wild and the domesticated, but rather in the form of a series of metamorphoses in which, uh, in which forest uh, transforms into garden, garden transforms into forest, persons transform into plants, divine bodies transform into gardens, human bodies are treated as plants, animals reveal themselves as plants, in short, in short, a permanent movement back and forth between macrocosm and microcosm, between types of environment or ecosystems and between ontological categories, a movement which provides an insight into the richness 
of the conceptions uh, that Amazonian populations have developed to describe and interpret the interactions between biotic <coughs> communities. Can one speak here of landscape? If one means by that the transfiguration of a site laid out in such a way that it constitutes an iconic sign of a reality which is distinct from its patent function, then for me there is no doubt that these Amerindian gardens are landscapes. The idea of transfiguration is manifest in all cases. Among the Achua and the Miranya, one can note, moreover, a narrowing of the gap between the sign and the referent, which converts the garden into a very, very ambiguous landscape. For the Achua, the plantation of a spirit imitating a garden is replaced by human plantation imitating the forest, but these plantations, the human plantations, are under the constant threat uh, of disappearing uh, if the gardeners displease the spirit of the garden, a disappearance which will anyway uh, happen in the end when the garden will be abandoned and the garden will then have lost its function uh, as a landscape since it will have become again a true forest for the Atua, but not for the spirits who recuperate this garden. In the Miranya case, the plantation of spirits imitating uh, the garden are replaced by human plantations stemming from the body of another spirit, but those who plant them, the humans, are under the constant threat of seeing their body treated as a garden by the, de the, the delegates of the, of the spirit, that is, of being dismembered and cut by diseases following the example of the body of the demiurge. Here again, ambiguity takes over. The initial transfiguration carries the cost of seeing humans transfiguring themselves against their will, with the results that it is the producers of signs, the humans, who are themselves threatened of becoming signs of what they have figured by creating their gardens. The subtle forms of landscape that native populations of Amazonia have managed to create, or the, the subtle form of landscape, that uh, native populations of Amazonia have managed to create in their gardens uh, offer, in my view, a conceptual yield far more interesting than what the anthropologists and the archaeologists and the historians usually call the landscape uh, in the loose sense of a subjectively apprehended uh, and anthropogenic ecosystem. Uh, and since the type of transfiguration in situ that these gardens realize can equally be detected in other subsistence gardens in other parts of the world, um, where there exists uh, uh, no tradition of literary or pictorial representation of landscape, particularly, of course, in Melanesia, and in Southeast Asia, uh, the field of comparative investigation that this perspective opens up uh, seems particularly promising. Proceeding in such a way is also uh, a means for me of being faithful to what I see as the general project of symmetrization, which I think is one of the missions entrusted to anthropology. By symmetrization, I mean the eff effort to render compatible and treat on an equal footing uh, the cultural features of the observer, whoever the observer is, and those of the observed, whoever 
the observed hour, so as to escape the situation where the point of view of the analyst doing the comparison encompasses the point of view of the members of the societies that are being compared, or at least uh, sets a convenient point of reference for its evaluation. Why could treating landscape as a transfiguration be construed as a symmetrization? Because the um, analytic point of view is not given here uh, at initio, either by the product of a supposedly universal disposition of human nature, uh, the capacity, for instance, of humans to apprehend subjectively uh, a place or the ability to leave a mark on it, which is obvious, or as the template provided uh, by a Eurocentric uh, concept. The point of view results from the never-ending operation by the means of which cultural features, norms, institutions, systems of signs are constituted as variants of one another within a set. And this set is here composed of the various man-made ecosystems that fall within the definition of a transfiguration in situ, that is, the deliberate conversion of a piece of land into a global iconic sign which highlights some features of the site previously not emphasized uh, in, uh, 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 in what it was before, before it was transfigured. In this perspective, Amazonian gardens are not landscapes because they resemble European pleasure gardens or Japanese gardens or Chinese gardens, but rather because Amazonian gardens, European gardens, Japanese gardens, Chinese gardens uh, are variants of one another within a broader group of transformation. <coughs> yeah, brandish my structuralist inheritance, uh, which includes also a number of other variants elsewhere. Each of them, each of them representing a particular expression of a process of transfiguration which is constitutive of the landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Descola, for your inspiring words. What a fine way to conclude our conference. We can continue these discussions over our banquet dinner at 7.30.